Hello everyone and welcome back to Bitwig Studio and Music Production. This is lesson 3.16 and in this lesson we're going to do a quick little wrap up of everything we've covered up until now, specifically what we did in just like the last 16 videos which has been a couple of creation projects and really just getting familiar with Bitwig Studio. And then at the end of this lesson, we're going to just kind of talk about where we're going. So this is gonna be a totally text-based lesson, but it's very important that we understand why it is we're doing what we're doing and why we're going in the order that we're going in to cover things. I know how easy it is to kind of open up a software for the first time and see all the effects and see all the instruments and see all the devices and just wanna get in there and get going, but you realize pretty quickly that you don't know where to go. And so you kind of sit there and you just open up things and kind of randomly turn knobs or turn faders and you know the results are completely incoherent and not very logical. And I'm trying to do is make all these processes logical to some degree. And once they become logical at that point, it's okay to go and to turn those knobs and to turn those faders and to just go a little bit crazy. But I'm a firm believer that understanding sort of the principles behind these larger concepts behind the larger production as a whole will help you out quite a bit down the road. So right now, all we really have done inside of Bitwig Studio is scratch the surface. We've opened it up, we've learned how to navigate, we've honestly touched on every single panel, every single view, um, we've looked at different ways to mess with automation, we've talked about setting up audio interface, you know, all of the nuts and bolts that you really need to understand before you can go any further. And personally, I think I've learned a lot about Bitwig Studio just in those two creation projects that I completed and also with the DJ sets and with the mixes that I've done because some of those processes are monotonous and you have to repeat them over and over again, but that repetition is really helpful because you just learn it so much better and you learn it in a very personal way. So the way I showed you guys how to stretch tracks um, in some of those earlier videos is still totally feasible and a way to go about it. But of course, after having to do it a hundred times, I developed my own system and now I could even do it in my sleep. So that's just kind of the strength of watching some of these videos that go step by step how to do things. But obviously it's up to you to go in there and actually practice because the more you practice, the more like second nature it's going to become. So let's talk about our creation project one and two. Uh, first bullet point here, less is more, and then keep it simple. So I hope what you've seen is that by uh, restricting ourselves and by setting these very specific rules, and honestly rules that would feel very crippling, uh, especially to those of you who are used to working with tons of instruments and tons of plugins and effects and all sorts of stuff, you'd be like, whoa, what are you doing? Why are you stripping it back? This is way too easy. Uh, quite the contrary, in my opinion, because once you really limit yourself, you're forced to think a little more creatively, you're forced to go outside of the box. And by doing that, you come up with these really interesting compositions that you would never come up with if you were stuck just working with presets and, you know, having to make the decision about what instrument to use as opposed to saying, okay, this is the only thing I have access to. Let's see what it's capable of. And as I wrote here, um, complexity is totally subjective. So I remember in one of the really early videos, we talked about that girl's generation song, I Got a Boy, and I was just going on and on about how complicated that was and how many tracks they probably would have had to use. I'd be really interested to see that actual project, which was probably made in Pro Tools, because I'd love to know, you know, how many plugins were they using? How many different instruments did they use? Or did they just stick to like one synthesizer and have to make a hundred patches? I mean, that track is really, really, complex in my opinion, but after going through and making my first couple of tracks, I would say they are just as complex, um, only they're complex in a different sort of way. So just because you use 30 different instruments, 30 plugins, 10 pieces of hardware, it doesn't mean your music is any more complex than somebody who just is using one instrument, one device, or one set of parameters creatively. And here's kind of the big overarching lesson of everything we've done in the past, I don't know, five or six videos. Learn what a parameter is meant to do and then experiment with it to find out just how much it can do. And a great example is the stretch parameter, which I have used and abused in my last two projects. So I'd bring in a normal sounding didgeridoo, which is actually true if you guys watch the video. I did use a didgeridoo sample. I wasn't just saying it for a comedic value. 
And then I would drop in a bunch of stretch markers or I'd scale at times two or subtract by two or change the tempo and push it and bend it and mangle it and adjust the pitch and all those other sorts of things and come up with these really unique uh, sort of sonic sounds coming from an acoustic instrument. Really something that is so hard for a lot of us to wrap our heads around because there's no equivalent to the sounds I came up with in the real world. These are only things you could come up with using the stretch parameter or maybe some really complex like granular synthesis, but we didn't even have to do that to get those sounds. And I think that's really, really cool. So remember, our goal, at least in this section, is to create. The aesthetic outcome is totally irrelevant right now. Doesn't matter if you hate the track or your buddy hates the track or your mom hates the track. It's all about creating. It's all about opening up the project and making something that lasts a certain duration of time that's completely yours and that's unique and original to you. And even if your goal is to be like a super legit music producer, you know, you want to be the next Avicii or whatever, well, Maybe you don't, because at this point, I'm not sure if he even makes his own sounds or if he just kind of hires somebody and he's, you know, the head of the dragon. I don't know. I'm not going to make any uh, claims right now. But even if your goal is to be somebody who is in that sort of um, what we refer to as like the EDM producer role, um, these creation tasks are actually quite imperative and will help your development quite a bit. And it doesn't matter if you've been doing this for three years or for two months, when you ever open up a project and you work on it and you create something that is helping you and even though right now some of the tricks and some of the manipulations we've been doing to these samples may not seem like it's going to have a place for you i can guarantee you in the future it probably will uh, the skills you learn from actually doing these projects goes well above and beyond anything i can show you inside of the program so do your best to focus on the sounds you're creating and arranging, not just the technology behind them. In one of like the first or second videos, I said, look, there's different types of people who go into this and a, a big number get into it and then sort of get sucked in by the technology and um, never really escape that. So they might be a master at knowing all these different types of compressors that have existed throughout history, but if they sat down and actually made something, have they actually created? A lot of them haven't, and that's okay because there's nothing wrong with being somebody obsessed with this gear. It is a really fascinating subject, and it's interesting to myself as well, but I also know that there's a time and a place for looking at that, and then there's a time and a place for creating. And I hope you guys realize as well that if you're watching these videos, our goal is at least in this section to create. Eventually, we might get into some more production oriented tasks, you know, where we're going to dissect a couple of different genres and then try to do our best to create our own. But what we'll be using to do that are all of these creation tools that we're going to be covering in these next videos. And speaking of the next videos, we're transitioning now into what I would refer to as the belly of the beast. So the Bitwig Studio interface, it all looks nice, it all looks clean, it's really fun to go around, but the strength of the program does lie with their built-in effects, their built-in instruments, and their built-in containers. And right now, we're gonna be focusing on audio effects. Of course, there's also a whole host of MIDI effects, but we'll be getting into that further down the road. And again, I'm going to stress the exact same principles I did at the top. Less is more, keep it simple, and complexity is subjective. Also, taking your time, um, and I kind of already mentioned this, but a lot of times when somebody opens a project for the first time, they rush into it without actually taking the time to learn and to listen, to see and to hear what exactly is going on, and I'm gonna help you guys out with that. So. This is my suggestion, and this is basically what we're going to be doing, but we're going to categorize all of the effects, the audio effects, uh, that come bundled with Bitwig, and we're going to then um, break all of these up into three or four different sections, and I'll talk about those in a future video. And then within each of our sections, within our categories, we'll go through the effects one by one, and we're going to try to understand what they're meant to do in a very sort of traditional way and how they impact our samples that we bring in. But then it's going to be up to you when we do our creation projects to see what these things are capable of doing beyond just what they were designed to be um, used for. And I always go back to that classic example of, you know, early Chicago house and Detroit techno music. 
you know, those guys couldn't afford the fanciest synthesizers or machines of the time, so they went out and bought something that was very cheap. Uh, the 808, of course, the famous drum kit, and then the 303, which you've heard on a number of tracks, even to today. Um, of course, now those machines go for thousands and thousands of dollars, which why somebody would pay that today, I have no idea because they're not doing anything new. They're just trying to replicate something from the past. But at the time, those guys were using those machines and they just really were sitting and experimenting with them for a long time and came up with something that those machines were never intended to do. Um, so just remember when you're working with effects, it can be exactly the same way. You don't just have to use them in a traditional context. You might be the person to find a new use for, you know, one of these very basic effects that just nobody has thought about yet. So taking your time and experimenting are very, very important. Here's going to be our approach moving forward in the audio effects section. We will be breaking down all of our audio effects into three distinct categories. Within each category, we'll briefly look at and discuss maybe one, sometimes two, maybe three effects at any given time. And after that discussion, you will be tasked with a creation project. And for the most part, they're all going to be the same. It's going to be take three samples and this effect and see what you can come up with. You know, and automation is, of course, fair game. All of the parameters that we've already touched are fair game. Because um, like I've been saying before, all of this content is just meant to build on itself. You know, and um, I hope that some of those connections are starting to occur for you guys, um, at least in your heads, if not with your ears and with your own work. And once we finish talking about all of the effects, we'll start to delve into these concepts of effects routing and really kind of audio routing as well. So sending effects to different channels to be processed, those sorts of things. We'll start to combine some of our effects, whether that's serially, so one effect after the other, or in parallel, meaning we're going to have a duplication of the original signal, and then each of those duplications will be affected differently. We'll go back and start talking more about spectral processing, which we did in an earlier video where we took our signal, we broke it up into three distinct bands on the frequency spectrum, and then processed all of those differently, or at least we could process those differently. And of course, if we're doing that, we're going to also have to talk about signal flow, which is just a fancy way of saying, um, you know, how the audio is going from one place to another. So of course, if you're sending audio to some kind of effect, it has to go in one end and come out the other. And how does that work? And how does it work, especially in regards to having multiple effects going, whether in serial or in parallel? So I hope you guys are very excited about this. Um, really, my goal is just that you're starting to see the logic, right? We can't just open up the project or, excuse me, open up the software and start doing super complex stuff. It just doesn't make any sense and it doesn't lend itself to creation. So again, we're stripping things back. We're keeping it very, very simple. But we've already covered so much at this point. And really, with just the tools and the creation projects I've shown you, you could very easily come up with your own album or your own EP. And although it may not be something that sells millions and millions of copies, it's still your creation. And that's what this is all about. And it's really your creation, especially if you're doing some of the manipulations that I've been doing in my projects, because those are things that nobody else is going to do. No one's going to come up with exactly the same thing as you have. And I don't know, for me, that's what makes all of this worth it. So strap in because we are about to go headfirst into audio effects inside of Bitwig Studio. So thank you guys for watching and you'll hear from me again in the next lesson.